Hi, I'm Andrea, and I'm Venezuelan. So I've been very close to the Venezuelan crisis. Venezuela is home to the highest uninterrupted waterfall in the world. Venezuela is home to the island the Spanish calls the Pearl of the Caribbean. Venezuela is home to the world's largest oil reserves, larger than Saudi Arabia. Venezuela is home to Nobel Prize winners, and Venezuela was home to investment and talent. Now, Venezuela is home to children who have been kidnapped. Venezuela is home to daily robberies. It's the home to corrupt politicians. And it's the home of millions of people who do not know when the next time they'll have the food or medicine they need is. I remember when I was a child, every summer holiday, every Christmas break, I would visit Venezuela for weeks at a time. And it was absolutely beautiful. Nothing compares to 25 degrees, sunny, warm weather all year round. Nothing like Warwick. <laughs> but December 2012 was the last time I went to Venezuela. Because visiting there and coming back alive is no longer a guarantee. For example, my grandmother, for the last two years, she's been working very hard to build a new life in Barcelona, Spain. Because in 2017, she locked the door to her apartment and left behind an untouched, unpacked flat full of notebooks, her memories, her perfumes. Why did she leave everything but a suitcase behind? The week before, my aunt's friend had left work and was assaulted on the way home. She had no money, no jewelry on her. So they couldn't rob her and decided to kidnap her instead. Three days later, when no one had paid their, her ransom, they decided to murder her. And her body was found at a garbage bin by the side of the road. And this is why my grandmother left the country. However, sometimes the violence is not enough to push people out. For example, my godmother, who's been an inspiration to me. She lived in Venezuela, and she vowed to never leave. She said she wanted to be there to see the system collapse. She wanted to be there to see the country we were born. She had strict curfews for her sons. She lived with bodyguards. On one Saturday, a couple of years ago, her youngest was kidnapped at 10. And on, his, on the following Tuesday, on his return, she was already helping her neighbor negotiate the ransom for their daughter. But even then, she continued to live in Caracas, the capital of Venezuela. However, this August, she moved to Madrid, and her son is here. It shows that you can no longer build a future or live in Venezuela anymore. So I've been inspired to highlight how unique this political, social, and economic crisis is, and the devastating effect it's had to intimacy and the relationships of families in the country. There are three main components to my talk. A brief explanation of the history of Venezuela, the current situation, which is hyperinflation, mass immigration, and finally looking forward at how we can help these people who've been forced out of their country in this diaspora. The idea I'd like to spread is that it takes courage to leave everything behind. But it's possible, as millions of Venezuelans have had to do as they leave their country full of economic insecurity, hunger, and violence. So for the context, it's been exactly 20 years since Hugo Chavez and the United Socialist Party of Venezuela took power in 1998. Before that, Venezuela is a democracy. And the president increased price, oil prices in 1989. And this led to a lot of unpopularity. There were riots started by workers in the capital Caracas, called El Caracaso, um, in the similar style of the gilet jaune or the yellow vest in France today, actually. And so in 1992, Chavez saw this continued unpopularity as an opportunity to seize power. He attempted a coup, but ultimately it failed. And he was jailed, but pardoned a couple years later. Finally, it's 1998, and he fairly wins the elections through a popular vote. In his inauguration speech, he apologized for his attempted coup, and he stated he was committed to the Venezuelan people to promote reforms that would improve their lives that the previous unpopular government seemed to not care about. 
And he was successful, at the outset at least. But two decades onwards, his once beautiful promises slowly rotted. There was no more investment in industry, and the price of oil decreased. So in 2013, when Chavez died, he left a collapsing economy and an unsafe country where Maduro took place, uh, took over. So now we move to 2019, and Venezuela is in crisis. The main problems faced are hyperinflation of 1 million percent, shortages of food, electricity, medicine, and no rule of law. Some even claim that Venezuela is run and bribed by narcotics officers. The traffickers. So the actual size of the crisis is not something you read about in the national newspapers. When you're in the country, it's censored. Instead, it's something Venezuelans feel and live on the daily. They hear about murders, kidnappings, robberies. To grasp this economic hardship Venezuelans face, it's the hyperinflation that's made life extremely uncomfortable. Simple things like grabbing lunch with friends become extremely difficult because $10 worth of money requires a large suitcase. I'm sure some historians in the room or even those who did GCSE history have the image of the 1923 Weimar Republic, German children playing with wheelbarrows of cash. That's what's happening today. There are indices like the Bloomberg Latte Index which show that in the last 12 months, the price of coffee in Venezuela has gone from 0.2 bolivares, that's the national currency, to 400 bolivares. At this rate, it's the same as you coming back to term three, ready to revise, and the library cafe is charging you 3,000 pounds for an Americano coffee that this morning you paid less than two pounds for. This bad economy is the main driver behind the three million official Venezuelans who have left the country, and the estimated unofficial eight million who have claimed they left. This is 25% of the population. 25% of Venezuela has left. After Syria, it makes it the largest mass immigration globally. Before, Venezuelans could travel across Latin American borders freely, much like here in Europe in the Schengen area. But now, because there's no controls, no rule of law, even official documents lack credibility. For example, when you pass your driver's test, your license is a PDF that's emailed to you to print out at home. This makes it easy to falsify documents, and it leads to distrust towards the 10,000 Venezuelans a day who are leaving the country by foot to neighboring South American countries and are being welcomed by xenophobia. In Venezuela, you can no longer discuss projects. You can't discuss what's happening in the future. You only discuss your problems, making everything an anchor of negativity. Those who leave their country do not make the decision lightly. They're taking a leap of faith. And we need to look forward how to support these um, people moving to the diaspora. So I want to finish off by saying, these millions of Venezuelans are trying to escape insecurity and violence. So we need to find a way to support them. My aunt explains, for example, she's been in Argentina for the last six months, that Venezuelan restaurants have become hubs of networking and support. As most of my audience here is not Venezuelan, helping out could mean this, going to a Venezuelan restaurant which I've seen pop up even in Camden Market in London. They show that you can succeed, even through hardship, and that if you build these communities abroad, out of nothing, they're still extremely powerful. But just as importantly, helping out could mean educating yourself and gaining a deeper understanding of the situation. Think about it. How much have you learned in the last 15 minutes if anything I've said has shocked you, surprised you, or outraged you, take a closer look at Venezuela when you leave this room. Imagine all the other crises happening around the world that you're not aware of because they're so far away. The connections you make with people and global issues around you are priceless. A nation 
is a story of shared memories and histories. But now those stories cannot exist on Venezuelan soil. My family and millions have had to leave everything behind in order to move forward from the crisis in their home. But I remain hopeful that these problems do have solutions and that we can move forward. Though the shared memories of our country are being forced out of Venezuelan borders, aún florecemos en el abismo, or in English, we can flourish, even in the abyss.